Welcome back to the First Nations Climate Initiative Beyond Zero Conference. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our keynote speakers today, um, starting with uh, Chief Terry Tiji, who is the elected regional chief of the British Columbia Assembly of First Nations and proudly serving his second term in this position. Terry's ancestry is the Kelf, Gitsan, and Sekini, and he's a member of the Takla Nation. As a former registered professional forester responsible for looking after the forests, forest lands, and forest resources, Terry is deeply involved in natural resource development. As regional chief, he was instrumental in the development and historic passing of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act in BC. Terry, it's my pleasure to introduce you. Over to you. Thank you, Alex. Deneza, Tsekuza, Skaiza. First of all, I want to acknowledge the territory that I'm calling from, the Claytley today, uh, the uh, Dakat people in North Central Ontario. Uh, thank you for the First Nations Climate Initiative for inviting me here today to, to say a few words. And uh, I, along with the, the ministers as well as MLA uh, Ellis Ross, uh, certainly are excited to join you today in this very critical topic of uh, going beyond uh, net zero. Uh, climate change certainly remains as the most existential issue that we face. Uh, in particular, uh, many have defined this as our uh, defining moment in our lifetime. Uh, some studies suggest that, that we're moving towards uh, the sixth mass extinction. Uh, but unlike uh, previous extinctions, it is caused uh, by human activity. Uh, over the last few years, we've definitely seen this in, in British Columbia as we were ground zero, especially over the last year in terms of climate change. The heat dome, the, the many wildfires we've experienced not only last year, but the last several years, uh, atmospheric rivers, floods and so on uh, has uh, collapsed our infrastructure and the governments uh, and certainly uh, taxed our, our government's emergency response system. Uh, some of the costs that were incurred by climate related events has, has certainly blown to extreme proportions in British Columbia. Uh, for example, uh, the total cost of fire suppression from the, the last uh, four fire seasons is over $2 billion. And the cost to, to rebuild after the floods of last year is all is exceeding $9 billion. Climate change and its impacts are, are irreversible. So limiting any global warming by reducing the stabilizing uh, concentrations of greenhouse gas emissions is incredibly urgent, especially now. Uh, but also challenging given the, the deep dependence of our economy within the, the carbon intensive developments and systems that, that we rely on. The United Nations in their last IPCC report stated that reducing greenhouse gases emissions across the entire energy sector requires significant transitions, including substantial reduction in overall fossil fuel uh, use and, and new and, and locked in and unabated uh, fossil fuel development. It is clear that we must switch to alternative energy sources and more energy efficient and conservation activities. Certainly everyone has a role to play in the transition to decarbonize the, the economy and society. I'm sure many good ideas will be coming out of this initiative and, and certainly a part of decarbonization is the recognizing that we must decolonize. And reconciliation plays an, an in particular uh, big role in terms of uh, decarbonization. decarbonization. <clears throat> For decades, development has uh, gone unchecked. And, and certainly during this time, uh, many developments have impeded many Indigenous peoples' uh, rights, uh, human rights, here not only in Canada, British Columbia, but around the world. So as, as part of the, the uh, really uh, decolonization and reconciliation, we must fully implement and recognize the United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, in particular, the, the tenets of free prior and informed consent. 
I want to recognize the, the Taltan Nation as they have just ratified yesterday the first, the very first Section 7 agreements, which will recognize their Indigenous governing bodies and then recognize the free prior and informed consent uh, by their Indigenous peoples. Operationalizing human rights and, can, uh, and a consent-based approach in, in climate mitigation action and strategies to achieve and maintain net zero across all economic sec sectors implies at least using free prior informed consent uh, decision-making processes, building a strong government-to-government -government relationships with our First Nations Indigenous governing bodies, uh, in particular uh, with uh, industry and with our First Nation governments. Respect for jurisdiction also means an equitable revenue sharing with uh, our First Nations peoples and our Indigenous governing bodies. It is also essential to recognize that First Nations government uh, government bodies, we have our own laws, values, worldviews, and, and ways of incorporating and, and making decisions for ourselves. To reach net zero emissions um, and going beyond net zero and, and, and really taking carbon dioxide uh, removal out of the, the atmosphere requires such carbon offsets, uh, includes beyond net zero, implies being capable of, of keeping emission neutral over the years. In this context, carbon dioxide removals play a critical role. But certainly uh, CDRs, as, as they are known as, they cannot do undo emissions. So preventing emissions coming out of uh, many projects is the ultimate goal. During the last two years at the British Columbia Assembly of First Nations, we've certainly supported many of our uh, First Nations um, communities and, and initiatives. We were never uh, a part of the uh, Clean BC, uh, really the, 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 the strategy to, to uh, go to net zero and, and deal with climate change. Rather, we developed our own with our First Nations uh, partners in terms of a climate BC, First Nations climate strategy. And within this action plan certainly calls for uh, climate action that is aligned with the United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples uh, to limit greenhouse gas em emissions and, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. First Nations are, are prepared, resilient, and to live in a world where uh, really I think there, there is opportunity, where there is opportunity to alternative energy projects, uh, protection, of our rights, title, and interests is, is paramount in, in this strategy, and also in incorporation of our worldview, our knowledge systems, and uh, recognizing that, that we do have our own ways of knowing and being in terms of making decisions. Lastly, I want to, uh, to highlight the importance of working together with the, with the Crown, the private sector, and First Nations, and, and certainly the uh, developments of yesterday with the Taliban and central government ratifying the first Section 7 agreements is an example of, of where we can go in terms of how uh, mega projects and, and, and really uh, projects can be uh, developed and recognizing that Indigenous peoples do have a role to play, a, a very critical role as another level of government uh, to uh, really transition from uh, a uh, high level of greenhouse gas emissions projects and and moving towards uh, alternative energy projects. And uh, I want to recognize all of you here today uh, really listening to uh, our most, uh, our biggest challenge in our lifetime, in our generation, is to deal with climate change. And, and certainly I, I appreciate uh, with uh, all of you participating today and, and I pass it back to you, Alex. Uh, thank you, Masicho. Thank you so much, uh, Chief TG. Uh, thank you for reminding us that uh, decolonization and decarbonization are two sides to the same coin. And uh, uh, your, your remarks are inspiring us to reach farther and higher and harder. Um, our next speaker is Minister Ralston. Uh, Bruce Ralston is the Minister of Energy, Mines and Low Carbon Innovation. His key priorities for the ministry include supporting the implementation of Clean BC, 
that that's the government's plan for climate action, and innovation in the clean uh, technology sector, an area that Minister Ralston has a long reputation for being interested in. Uh, he also oversees BC Hydro um, to ensure BC's wealth of clean and affordable and reliable hydroelectricity uh, powers the province into the future decarbonized economy. Really looking forward to uh, hearing your remarks, Minister Ralston. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Alex. Um, as uh, as you've said, I'm uh, British Columbia's Minister of Energy, Mines, and Low Carbon Innovation. Uh, let me begin by acknowledging I'm speaking today from the territory of the Coast Salish people here in Vancouver, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil Tooth uh, nations. Uh, I appreciate and we appreciate the vision and hard work of the First Nations Climate Initiative uh, in bringing us together. Let me personally thank the representatives from the Nishka Nation, uh, Metlakatla First Nation, and Heisla Nation for working together to support the development of net zero energy in your territories, including exceeding provincial and federal emission reduction targets. And looking forward to foster the development of your communities with new industrial developments and technologies that could mitigate global climate change. Con consistent with FNCI's vision of fighting climate change, British Columbia strives to have the most responsible, inclusive and progressive resource industry. It's always been our ambition and over the past number of years we have seen our industry uh, take steps to walk the talk. These steps include, for example, the, the elimination of routine flaring, the introduction of methane regulations, and the electrification of gas processing facilities. With our new Clean BC Roadmap to 2030, as Alex referred to it, we continue to demonstrate we are one of, if not the most responsible jurisdictions in the world. We are bringing forward stronger targets to reduce met methane emissions from the oil and gas sector, uh, by 75% by 2030, and to eliminate nearly all industrial methane emissions by 2035. We are working on new large industrial facilities to demonstrate how they align with BC's legislated emission targets and prepare plans to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. We are working to place a cap on emissions for natural gas utilities while providing a variety of pathways to achieve this. Additionally, we're working to enhance the Clean BC plan for industry to help reduce emissions while supporting a strong economy. As an example, last year, the Clean BC Industry Fund, which is funded by carbon tax revenue, provided $13.6 million to connect a processing plant in Dawson Creek to BC's clean electricity grid, retiring four uh, on-site natural gas turbine generators. The fund also provided uh, 2 million to replace 254 well site pneumatic methanol pumps with electric pumps uh, operated by solar energy. These are just a few of the examples of the millions of dollars invested to support our strong economy while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Another reason we have the most responsible industries is because of our meaningful partnership with First Nations. Earlier this year, we saw BC's industry take a significant step forward to becoming an inclusive industry when 16 nations along the coastal gas pipeline, uh, pipeline route signed option agreements to acquire 10% equity interest in the pipeline. Further, we've seen a number of First Nations enter into partnerships to construct the pipeline. Most recently, OJ Pipelines entered into formal agreements with the Skin Tai Nation the Wet'suwet'en First Nation and the Witset First Nation to build Section 7 of CGL. This partnership leverages each nation's knowledge and commitment to the land while providing significant opportunities in the region. But to see our industry progress and to meet the targets established in our Clean BC Roadmap to 2030, we will need to shift away from higher emitting energy sources. I understand that later today, you will hear from experts, proponents, and innovators on the Renewable Energy Panel, as well as the Hydrogen Panel. Hydrogen is a crucial pathway for BC's transition away from higher carbon fuels to a cleaner, low carbon energy system to meet these goals. Hydrogen alone has the potential to reduce the province's emissions by over 20, 30% of the 2050 Clean BC target. 
Hydrogen is one of the best solutions we have to significantly reduce emissions in sectors such as heavy duty transportation, industry, and remote communities. In the transportation sector, hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles help meet the targets in British Columbia's zero electric vehicle mandate for light duty vehicles. More importantly, hydrogen can replace diesel in medium and heavy duty transportation. BC is also investing in remote and off-grid communities, many of which are indigenous communities, to share expertise, replace diesel generated power, and deploy pilot projects that demonstrate hydrogen's position in BC's energy landscape. To kickstart BC's uh, hydrogen market, we need to de-risk investment by ensuring we have clear government regulatory support and policy tools to develop the hydrogen economy in British Columbia. The BC hydrogen strategy clarifies how we will support the development of low carbon intensity hydrogen in British Columbia. And with more than 60 supporting policy actions over the next 10 years, we are unlocking hydrogen's potential. There are approximately 40 hydrogen projects currently proposed or under construction in BC, and that number is growing. These projects represent more than 4.8 billion in proposed investment in BC. Another support for these hydrogen projects is the BC Hydrogen Office, which serves as a one-stop shop for coordinating hydrogen project investment interest in British Columbia. BC is also uniquely positioned for hydrogen export opportunities with our clean, low-cost electricity and robust carbon capture and storage potential. Given our proximity to uh, export markets, British Columbia can capture a significant portion of the global hydrogen market estimated to be greater than 305 billion by 2050. Were BC to capture a, a mere 5% market share in those regions, the export market could be potentially 15 billion annual. Let me emphasize this. British Columbia is committed to engaging with First Nations, industry, stakeholders, and our international partners to create export supply chains and foster support for our energy exports, including the emerging hydrogen market. I'd like to thank you for providing me with the opportunity to speak with you today, and I wish you a successful conference. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Ralston. And uh, there's a number of uh, really important things you've emphasized that are consistent with what FNCI has been working on, including electrification, methane reduction, directing carbon tax into emission reduction and negative emissions, First Nations equity and the new infrastructure, and the central importance that hydrogen is going to play in our decarbonized economy. So thanks again for your, your introductory and keynote comments. And uh, I'd like to shift now to our next speaker, who is Ellis Ross. Uh, Ellis was a elected uh, a member of the Legislative Assembly for Skeena in 2017 and again in 2020. He currently serves as the official opposition critic, critic for energy and LNG. Uh, Ellis was previously uh, served as the official opposition critic for environment and climate change strategy and as Minister of Natural Gas Development and Minister Responsible for Housing. Before this, Ellis served as the Heisel Nation, on the Heisel Nation Council for eight years, from 2003 to 2011. In 2011, he was elected Chief Counselor for the Heisel Nation and then was re-elected by acclamation in 2013. Uh, it's a real honor to introduce you, Ellis. Uh, thank you for your comments. Over to you. Thanks, Alex. Good to see you again. I normally just see you in the airports. Uh, yes, and thank you for that uh, brief uh, outline of my history in politics. Uh, get right to it. Heisler's history in environmentalism, and basically that's what we're talking about here today, goes back more than 50 years, long before environmentalism was a thing. And why we were doing it was not to shut down the economy. It was to get industry to clean up its act. Long before me, uh, the leaders of Heisla were actually getting government and industry to stop dumping waste into our land, water, and air. And we did it on the record with the government, whether it was an aluminum smelter or the local pulp and paper mill. In fact, two agreements that we signed, one with the, the aluminum smelter and the pulp and paper mill, were based on environmental impacts, 
not on economics like what we see uh, currently today. One company in particular paid top dollar to renovate their mill. The other one packed up shop and left instead of uh, cleaning up the environmental standards. This is not an easy topic for me. And uh, now I'm going to leave uh, the, the, the gist of, of your conference topic here to the rest of the speakers. I'm going to talk about First Nations involvement in the economy and the society that goes back more than 50 years in our territory alone. First of all, in terms of reconciliation, it's not new. In our territory specifically, reconciliation started happening in 2004 with, with the advancement of the Haida court case on a duty to consult and accommodate. And my band made full well, uh, well use of that, that case law, along with all the other case law like uh, Gladstone and uh, uh, Delgamu and uh, all those other court cases. But the product of what we did back there in 2004, along with the partnership with industry and government of the day, is why a band like mine, the highs of nation, are now successful and independent. In fact, they're independent at the individual level, where people are now getting the ability to get a good job, get a mortgage, get a RRSP, get a truck, everything that normal Canadians took for granted. At the council level, they are now independent to do their own projects without begging government for money. The true definition of independence, and this is going to matter for what I'm going to say later on in this conversation. I, I, I don't have a definition for reconciliation, and I know everybody else does. I know that. But if your definition doesn't include the topic on the violence of poverty, unemployment, imprisonment, children in government care, substance abuse, addictions, or suicide, then I've got no use for it. It's the people that matter, especially when you're trying to deal with what has been referred to as Canada's shame, and nobody can resolve this. Government programs will not resolve this. Government money will not resolve this. It's got to be led by First Nations and First Nations leadership in partnership with industry and government, not the other way around. The other thing I'd like to point out, uh, second of all, the world has changed. The reality of energy exposed the world to the realities of energy and how energy is the foundation of everything that we have taken for granted. And I'm talking about First Nations and non-First Nations alike. Flicking on the, your switch there, where does electricity come from? Most likely it's gonna come from Site C. Where does your gasoline come from, your diesel? And why are the costs going through the roof? This is now a political, global, issue. It's geopolitics on a level that we have never seen before. And where is it coming from? Well, it's been around forever, of course, because we all know about Saudi Arabia oil and gas. Uh, we know about China's thirst for energy and India's thirst for energy. But really, what is bringing this to the forefront is the Russia's Ukraine of Ukraine, uh, Russia's U invasion of Ukraine. And it's shown us what happens to a country like Germany who goes with ideology and rhetoric instead of realities? Germany's decision to shut down all forms of energy, LNG, coal, nuclear, has now shown them what it's like to, to, to be dependent on a country like Russia. And First Nation leaders, we know what dependence means. We're dependent on Ottawa money. And that's how Ottawa has controlled us for so many decades. And that's why so many First Nations are trying to get out of dependence on Ottawa money and trying to get into the idea of making our own money so ultimately we can resolve our own issues on our own terms. And on the other side of that, Germany's political decisions and rhetorical decisions has made life unaffordable for its citizens. Their citizens are now paying the highest energy costs in Europe and they're gonna, go, they're gonna keep getting higher. And when you raise the cost of energy, it affects everything else, especially transportation in terms of gas and diesel, which will raise the cost of goods and services, including groceries. And that's happening right now here in BC. It's happening now in Canada. We are not giving energy the respect it needs. We don't even have a domestic energy policy here in BC. We don't have an export policy. We're, we're talking around it. 
And we're not talking about energy equals affordability. Now, I've been watching energy initiatives since 2004. I've been a part of every single environmental assessment and council from 2003 to 2017 and all the permitting processes around it. So I understand that. That is real environmentalism. In fact, that opens a door to looking at different innovative uh, inventions, for lack of a better word. But we've got to understand which of these advancements are academic and which can be applied on a realistic on a realistic level. But we've got to also got to understand that a quality of life matters. And anything that government decides in terms of raising the, the standards usually equates to affordability. Either the ratepayer is going to call, pay for that extra cost, the taxpayer, or if a cost is put onto a company, that company will pass that cost on to the consumer. It's just, just basic economics. Somebody's got to pay for it. And this question here, when we're talking about all these advancements, who is going to pay for it and who is going to look out for the people? I'm not ashamed to say that since 2003 to 2017, including the last five years in MLA, I've never lost my focus on people. It matters. It means everything to me. Okay. Thank you so much, Ellis. Uh, your words, as always, are very inspiring. And thank you for reminding us to focus on the people. Um, you said a lot of uh, important things and emphasis on on independence uh, and First Nations independence is a way to uh, really address poverty um, and uh, and First Nations partnership. And uh, I'm I'm glad to say that the New Energy Systems Panel features um, many companies who are committed to operating uh, in BC. Uh, on one basic one basic principle, and that is uh, in partnership with First Nations, and they're bringing uh, new ideas and innovations. And as you emphasized, those innovations need to be cost competitive in the world, or else they're not going to happen. And uh, that's where we can see leadership from the provincial and federal governments in terms of helping to make uh, those initiatives uh, cost effective. So let me shift. Now to our final keynote speaker, uh, it's a real honor to introduce uh, Minister Gilbo. Um, Stephen Gilbo is, is Canada's Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Uh, he's an activist and strategic advisor. He co-founded Equitaire, the largest environmental organization in Quebec, and served as its senior director from 2008 to 2018. He also worked as a director and campaign manager for Greenpeace and was a strategic advisor for more than 10 years at Cycle Capital Management, a Canadian fund dedicated to the development of clean technologies. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have uh, a leader like yourself uh, with us today, Mr. Gilbo. Uh, we need your activism in order to get beyond zero and recover the climate and your partnership uh, with First Nations. And so it's my pleasure to introduce you and to hand the mic to yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. And good afternoon. And thank you for the invitation to participate in the First Nation Climate Change Institute's Beyond Zero event. I'd like to acknowledge that I am joining you today from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to share this message with you as you pursue your important work to tackle climate change. Conversations like those uh, you are leading today are essential part of developing informed responses to the climate crisis we are collectively facing. I'd first like to take a moment to recognize the crucial work the FNCI is doing to fight climate change, alleviate First Nations poverty, and restore critical biodiversity. As you know, the Prime Minister has affirmed that there's no more important relationship to Canada than the one with Indigenous peoples. I share this commitment, and I am committed to strengthen the nation-to-nation -nation relationship with First Nation based on the recognition of rights, respect, cooperation, partnership. We know that there's no path forward in the fight against climate change without 
My apologies. And biodiversity loss without your contributions, knowledge, and science. I'm here today in the spirit of partnership to support you in conversations to explore how we can mitigate climate change and adapt to the effects of a changing climate. Our government recognizes the unique and disproportionate impacts that First Nations are experiencing as, as a consequence of climate change. And I know that the climate crisis is real and immediate threat to First Nations. We are committed to working in partnership with you to support First Nations climate leadership and self-determined climate action. I join you today following Canada's recent release of the 2030 Emissions Reduction Plan, the ERP as we call it, which was tabled in Parliament late March 2022. The science is very clear. Canada needs to take more climate action and act faster to fight climate change. The ERP is the government's next major step in fighting climate change and creating good, sustainable jobs in Canada. The ERP includes a series of new mitigation measures and strategies, building on the foundation established by the 2016 Canada-wide framework and the 2020 Enhanced Climate Plan, and incorporating the best available science, Indigenous knowledge, and advice from Canada's Net Zero Advisory Council. The plan provides a roadmap that goes sector by sector for the first time in the history of our country to identify climate action strategies for Canada to reach our 2030 target, to reduce emissions by 40 to 45% below 2005 levels, and a pathway for net zero emissions by 2050. Supported by an investment of $9 billion, the 2030 emissions reduction plan include actions to reduce emissions from home and buildings, increased the number of net zero emission vehicles on our road, decarbonized the oil and gas sector, increased renewable and clean energy across Canada, helped industries adopt clean technology and protect historic levels of nature in our country. Collaboration with other levels of government, indigenous peoples, expert industry, the financial sector, stakeholders, and Canadians is another key component of the 2030 ERP. In fact, we received a little more than 28,000 individual submissions uh, as we were preparing this, uh, the, this important plan. Full implementation of the measures and strategies in the plan will rely on close collaboration. We can't do this by ourselves. Particularly important to our partnership with First Nations on climate, the recent 2030 Emissions Reduction Plan and Budget 2022 announced new investments to support Indigenous climate leadership including close to $30 million over three years that is being administered by the Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs Canada. This investment in Indigenous climate leadership will support self-determined action in addressing Indigenous peoples' climate priorities and the phased implementation of distinction-based climate strategies. I'm pleased that the federal officials will advance this work with Indigenous partners, and I look forward to what we can achieve together over the next three years and beyond. I'm also very pleased to be working to advance the Enhanced Environment and Climate Change Canada's Low Carbon Economy Fund, which will include a new $180 million Indigenous Leadership Fund. This new fund will support clean energy and energy efficiency projects led by First Nations, Inuit and Métis communities and organizations. I look forward to hearing from my officials about the results of the early engagement with First Nation First Nation partners to co-develop a program framework to support Indigenous-led emission reduction project in Indigenous communities. The work will lead to opportunities for Canada to better facilitate the participation of First Nations communities in the clean energy sector, including by fostering First Nations clean energy leadership through deployment of renewable energy projects and energy efficiency improvements across Canada. Notably, as part of the Low Carbon Economy Fund announcement, the Emissions Reduction Plan committed $32.2 million over two years to support the Atlan Hydro Expansion Project in British Columbia. This project will provide clean electricity to the Yukon and help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This new investment augments previous federal commitment of $83.9 million to, to the projects. Tackling climate change and building a strong, resilient and clean economy that provides benefits and employment opportunities for Indigenous peoples 
will be the cornerstone of creating a prosperous future for our country, one that we can all share. The Government of Canada recognizes that support for co-development, collaboration, and Indigenous self-determination is critical to the federal climate action. This includes improving food security, community health, clean energy, resilient infrastructure, and the protection of the biodiversity, while building capacity to lead on climate action. I'm looking forward to what we will achieve together, and I am optimistic that our collaboration will strengthen and enhance our climate policies and programs and lead to positive climate outcomes. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. I wish you the best in your important discussions. Merci. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Gilbo. Uh, thank you for recognizing the importance of First Nations leadership and partnership between the federal government and First Nations communities and governments. Uh, as an activist, I know that you understand uh, the importance of pushing and um, FNCI is certainly pushing and wants to push the federal government to higher ambition and to global ambition. And uh, President Clayton invited you this morning to uh, participate with FNCI and trying to work with other countries to help them reduce their emissions. Because we all know that what we do in Canada isn't necessarily going to uh, mitigate climate change. Um, we need to help others achieve what they need to achieve in order to heal the climate. So we want you to act globally as well as locally. And we appreciate the fact that uh, given your long history of activism, which started when you were five years old in the backyard, um, uh, I'm sure that that's still very active in your mind. So thank you so much uh, for your keynote remarks and thanks to all the other elected leaders uh, you've uh, inspired us and we're excited about uh, the sessions to come. Uh, let me just uh, make that transition. We're going to take a small break. Um, uh, before we do, I just want to thank uh, Emily Black and Dave Nicolation, who are going to moderate the next two sessions. Uh, and together with the speakers, they're volunteering their time uh, because they are passionately devoted uh, to this topic. So thank you very much, uh, Emily and Dave. Uh, and Emily will pick things up uh, right after the break. Um, so we'll see you at uh, 10 o'clock. And you just need to navigate to the next session with your Whova app. Thanks very much for listening and for being here. We'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.